practice where variables come together to produce their effect. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody else in the world has ever talked about a speaker um, as a locus. What do you mean by that odd turn of phrase? Well, precisely what I just said. Um, when I say something, I'm saying it right now. I wouldn't be saying it if I were a chimpanzee. So my, the history of the human species is all here, helping me do this. That's not me, though. I, I am a product of that. And uh, if anything starts because of my genetics, it starts because of my genetics and not because of me. Now, all I say also is the product of an enormously long history of things I've read, things I've heard, things I've said, things I've done, and so on. They have changed me, changed that genetic endowment in such a way that I am answering your questions in, in the way I am. But that isn't anything starting within me either. If, if I had not known about the role of contingencies of reinforcement or natural selection, I would have had to suppose that things originated in me. And that was the case prior to Darwin and the behaviorism. But having then seen how selection by consequences will produce uh, the body that I have here when at birth, or slightly before perhaps, and how the process of opposition, which is an evolved process, has changed that body throughout my lifetime so that it behaves this way, there's nothing left in there of a B.F. Skinner saying anything. I am that person saying this now, but I am not originating. I am a place in which a genetic and personal history have come together to produce what I'm saying. But I am a locus, and I, <clears throat> I feel no... I, it doesn't seem to threaten me at all. I don't feel robbed of any dignity, by putting it that way. Why do you think so many people do feel robbed? If you, if you tell, mm. I find with undergraduates, mm. if, if you try to teach the doctrine that you've just been uh, uh, yeah. explaining, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> they resent it. Um, they, they feel that their, their freedom, that their joy in life, mm. uh, yeah. their purpose for being mm. has been taken away yeah. from them. Well, it all depends on what's taken away. <laughs> A juvenile delinquent is all too happy to have you say, well, I feel sorry for you, really, you shouldn't be punished because you've had a bad background, you grew up in a, in a bad place and so on, and your father neglected you and your mother was off on the town or something. And that's why you're a delinquent and we'll, we'll have to forgive you. It's not your fault. But now supposing they're talking to a very good basketball player and saying, you really are very good, but remember, you're six feet seven tall you had a wonderful coach in high school. You got a, a scholarship to college and were able to play, you know, year after year after year. And then you got, uh, you're getting a huge salary now and can devote your life to playing. That's why you're a good player. Oh, no, I am a good player. You say, but you, uh, you won't say I'm delinquent. But uh, by God, you're not going to be robbed of, of your reputation as a great player. Uh, I think there's something inconsistent there. And I think the way to straighten it out is either to uh, hold everyone responsible for what they do and give everyone credit for what they do. And I, I don't think we're willing to do that. And uh, I would prefer the other. And I think I, I, I think it's, 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 it's good to be proud of what you've done. It's good to be ashamed of what you've done. These are cultural practices which have got you to do things. I, I would praise people, even though I don't think what I'm praising is anything more than something that will be changed by my praise. My, I, I, I will be, uh, if, you, if you say, great, then that's more likely to be done next time. You say, uh, if, you, if you say, great, then that's more likely to be done next time. You, say. you know, uh, almost any school of psychotherapy or behavior therapy or religion or philosophy yeah. that I know of emphasizes they, saying to people, you have choices. 
today yes. is the beginning of is the first day of the rest of your yeah. life. You yeah. have choices. You can choose where you're going to go with your life yeah. from here. Do you, do you think that there's any sense in which people do have choices? Well, there are situations in which there are different things that can be done, and one of them will be done, and you call it a choice. Now, you can also do something called decision making, which is to work on yourself or the setting so that one thing or the other is done. You're stuck between two things, like Balaam's ass, and you've got to do something to do one or the other, or you'll die. And so you fiddle around, this bag, this, this one over here looks better, I like to go, I'm white-handed, I'll go to the right, or still do something that get, gets you to respond. And you say, I, I decided what to do, and I made my choice. But these are entirely determined by environmental events. The interesting the correlate of what you're saying, though, is that people don't want to injure a belief in choice, and so they turn to ineffective methods. Teachers don't want to teach because that injures the student's creative learning. This goes way back, Comenius, back three or four hundred years ago. The more the teacher teaches, the less the student learns. But you want students to learn, so you mustn't teach. That's Carl Rogers said as much as that. In his own field, he said as much as that, too. You want the individual, or the, the client, to be the one who will come up with a solution. If you give him the solution, you, you've robbed him of the ability to, to find it for himself. This is true of, of all claims for creativity and so on. If you show an influence, oh yes, he was influenced by so well, then you've robbed him of, of some originality. You see, we, we try so hard to keep that imagined inner entity or, or ego working in a given way. I mean, I, we don't want to take that as a way. And in my book, Beyond Sleep and Dignity, it was a demonstration of how much damage that has done to our cultures. Um, how do you explain the fact that uh, people don't do what they're told to do? They have to, in some yeah, sense, yeah. find their own yeah. solution. Oh, well, well, first of all, make the distinction between rule governed and contingency shaped behavior. Teachers construct situations in which students do things for irrelevant reasons because later on they will do them and get good reasons to follow. So that it's a matter really of, of priming the behavior which is then truly taken over. Now, that can be done in a school. And if the school builds up behavior which does pay off in the world at large, it's a good school. And so you teach people to analyze situations, describe them, extract from them rules to follow, then the consequences follow too. And from that point on, you have originated something in the sense that you have got yourself to do something that did pay off. But how many people know how to find rules from the contingencies they face. That's, so that should be taught. But it's not teaching creativity. It's teaching the manipulation of a world verbally, which then leads to action, which is then followed by consequences. So you always come out with a behavior followed by consequences, or you haven't got anywhere. You say, just following rules is nothing. And you don't like to follow rules. I don't like to follow rules. But if somebody tells me to do something, and I do it, and consequences follow, I may even say thank you for telling me. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a crucial topic in current behavioral thinking and research and, mm. and theorizing, so I'd like to spend a little more time on it. What, what do you mean by a rule? You, you've introduced the distinction between rule governed and contingency yes. shaped behavior. Once you can talk about behavior, or talk about the world, you can help other people come into effective contact with the world and with the origin of verbal behavior in the human species only. Enormous advances were made because it was no longer up to the individual to learn everything through what happens to him as an individual or her. Um, and you get then a culture forming which primes behavior, models behavior, gets the behavior out so that things can happen 
that has happened in the first place only rarely to one person and now happened to everyone. Somebody first discovered something about something. That would have been the end, and, but that, and it might have been a very difficult contingency that taught it. If it hadn't been put down and transferred as a rule in, in, uh, in text or passed down by the rules verbally and so on, the, what has happened to our what is called a culture is that there has evolved an enormous source of rules which, if you follow, will lead you to do things that will be reinforced. Science does that too. Uh, science is nothing but a complex set of rules for a of action. Governments have rules which uh, get you to do what they won't punish you <laughs> for doing. Uh, religions have rules for the same kind of thing. In, in business, you've got uh, all of the prices and all of these kinds of things, which are agreements, verbal agreements as to what is going to happen, what you will get if you pay so much and so on. It's all rule governed behavior. And cognitive psychologists psychology are taking it over now. They study how people follow rules, but not with the contingency of sowing. Well, if you only follow rules for good reasons, uh, that it would be that you have to be, you've had, your behavior of following rules must have been reinforced somehow or other. And that gets you into a difference between the behavior which is contingency shaped, and that's the real behavior. That's when you're doing things because consequences have followed when you've done it. And following rules, which is temporary. You follow the rule, and then the consequences follow, and you're there. You come to uh, the Cambridge Valley, I like uh, good Italian food, and I say, well, go to Luigi's. Very good food. That's advice. That's a rule. Uh, this is uh, a description of what will happen if you go to Luigi's. You go and get good food, and from that point on, if you go again, it's not because of, my, of the rule at all. It's because of the food you got. And that's, that's all of science is that. Somebody discovers you do it this way and something will happen. Very unusual, very rare contingency, but accidental. And, but after that, it's no longer accidental. Now you do it because of the rules. It's, a, it's all, all in, the, in, in the, my book on verbal behavior, but I didn't get it out quite that mm -hmm. far. Mm -hmm. I think you've, you've also talked about it at other times, uh, uh, book learning versus practical behavior. Uh, yes, well, there's an old distinction between knowledge by description and knowledge by experience. That's it. Knowledge by description is rule-governed knowledge. Mm -hmm. You do things because you've been because the consequences have been described, mm -hmm. and that's what cognitive people. Cognitive science, that's the cognition in cognitive science, is knowledge by description. Uh, describe settings, what would you do, and so on. Mm -hmm. The knowledge by experience is operant conditioning. It's what it's what changes take place in an organism when contingencies have been imposed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to produce it, mm -hmm. produce the behavior. We've all seen kids so commonly, and I've occasionally seen it in my adult friends as well, where you start to show them how to do something, and they say, don't do it for me, I'll do it myself. Yes, exactly. Why? Well, because uh, they would prefer, uh, it's, it's more fun to be contingency shaped than to, to follow rules. Think of, think of how much we tell, tell kids to do. Uh, you clean your teeth this morning, go clean your teeth, now sit down, don't, 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 uh, wash your hands and so on. We, we boss them around where, where, where no good contingencies do follow. The teeth wasn't bothering them <laughs> at the moment, or, they, uh, or the hands weren't, uh, weren't interfering with eating and all of that. So that uh, we have a burden of, of just too many rules which are followed with nothing else happening to reinforce following them. And so we attack those who give us the rules. Uh, I've been supplying you with prompts for your verbal behavior, but there must be things that you would like to share with us that I have failed to prompt. So what else would you like to tell us about that has to do with <laughs> verbal behavior? Well, I suppose uh, if you allowed me, I would get around to my battle with the cognitive psychologist. It, it is essentially verbal concerning verbal behavior. They have given up on behavior as a function 